Hi and hello. Uh, I'm uh, Peter Arak, the head of the Polish Economic Institute, and I would like to welcome you in our part of the internet uh, debate uh, on uh, contemporary economics and uh, the pan post pandemic order. Um, one of the crucial, um, I would say, questions is asked by many years, and especially after, um, after the pandemic, where um, uh, stimuli packages uh, are being introduced in the European Union, uh, in the United States. Uh, and the biggest question, I think, is can the state be a good investor? Is uh, the state spending a lot of money uh, a good investor? The most typical answer that you would hear from a Polish economist is that no, uh, the private companies are the best investors. But uh, I don't want to speak uh, more uh, on the topic because we had a, a bit of a delay uh, due to technical reasons. Uh, we're going to have uh, you know, a great discussion uh, together with um, uh, Philip Heimberger from uh, VIV and uh, Wojciech Patras from uh, University of Cardiff, who's also a um, co-author of the paper with uh, uh, Jakub Savulski. Uh, and I give the floor to, to Jakob. Uh, Jacob, please talk about the paper. Uh, uh, due to some technical issues, uh, he's not going to be seen. He's just going to be presenting. So the, go, the voiceover is just going to be present with us today. Sorry for that. Jakob. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Sorry, because uh, I have some problems with my camera. Uh, I share the screen. Uh, please tell if can you see it. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you. So as Piotr has said, I will present main conclusions from our paper in which we try to answer a simple question. Can the state invest our money well? Uh, and it is an especially important question, I think, in the current moment when I think we observe a shift in the approach to fiscal policy in the global mainstream both in the policymakers and economists' view. Uh, fiscal policy is now recognized to be the main tool uh, to boost the economy after the corona crisis. Uh, so the short answer for uh, our question uh, is yes, the state can be a good investor, uh, which means that it can, it can obtain high rate of returns on public expenditure. But, when we think about public investment, we usually imagine spending on roads, motorways, uh, buildings, so public infrastructure. And meanwhile, uh, scientific research, some of which I will show you later in the presentation, shows that particularly high rates of return are obtained on public expenditures on human capital. So for example, childcare, education, uh, or preventive, preventive healthcare. Uh, so expenditures that are not usually recognized as investment, at least in the official uh, formal definition of investment. We recognize it as a problem uh, because investment expenditure is one of the measures used to evaluate government activities. Uh, with the current definition, there is a risk that the outcome can be uh, excessive concentration on the expansion and modernization of physical capital at the expense of spending on areas related to human capital development. Uh, therefore, we propose to include investment in human capital in the official definition of public investment. This is the main policy recommendation from our uh, paper. We are aware that uh, this is a kind of revolutionary uh, proposal. Mm, at first, it would require to define what exactly do we mean by, by human capital investment. Then it would require proper changes in national statistics and system of national accounts. So it is a long journey, uh, but by our paper, we want to just open the discussion and stimulate the debate in this area on the role of human capital investment issued by state uh, in the economy. To justify our proposal, we make a, a quite broad literature review on the rate of returns on various public expenditure. The first important conclusion is that um, public expenditure on education, 
have large positive impact on uh, GDP, earnings, um, and public revenue. On the slide, I show you uh, only some example publication. In the paper, we include a broader, li broader list. Uh, the, the rate of return from public expenditure on education uh, is calculated uh, at around 10%, sometimes even higher than 10%. Mm, and two other important conclusions from this part are that first, Usually the rate of returns are exceptionally high when the public interve intervention concerns children from low income families. And second, the rate of return uh, are high for investments in early childhood programs. Uh, so pre-primary education, uh, for example, nurseries or kindergartens. And another uh, area of uh, effective public investment is healthcare. Uh, the economic benefits of improving uh, citizens' health include increased productivity, uh, longer working age of population, fewer people taking social benefit, benefits, fewer uh, people taking sick leaves. And so what may be, I think, especially important in the context of corona crisis is that uh, scientific research show high rate of returns uh, from investment in mental health of uh, population. And to enrich our analysis, we also make some statistical uh, analysis of uh, the public and private sectors investment in human and physical capital. Of course, we make some simplification. We, uh, as investment in human capital, we treat spending on education and health, but except for hospital services, which uh, we assume that are closer to the function of saving human health rather than to building human capital uh, through health. And there are a few main conclusions from our analysis. The first, uh, the first one is most investment in the human capital in the economy comes from the public sector. Uh, public sector is responsible for around 80% of human capital investments. The private sector mostly invests in uh, fixed capital, while the public sector mostly invests in human capital, as shown in this uh, graph. And the second uh, most public investment in the EU countries are investment in human capital, when we use this, our extended definition of public investment. On average, around 75% uh, of public investment goes to human capital development. Um, and what is more, there are large differences between the EU countries in terms of the share of public investment in GDP. Uh, it varies from 8% of GDP in Greece to 16% uh, of GDP in Sweden. And what is important, this difference result mainly from the scale of in investment in human capital rather, rather than uh, physical capital. Uh, and finally, uh, when we use this, our extended definition of public investment, they account for around a quarter of uh, total public expenditure. Uh, and it is much more than in the traditional definition uh, in which this share is less than 10%. That gives us completely different picture of public sector. Um, what else draws attention on this chart is that the last four states are uh, Southern European countries, which all were hit by the austerity policy in the past uh, decade. And to sum up, uh, the traditional understanding of public investment is that when states spend money on uh, roads or buildings, these are investments, uh, but when it spends on people, these are rather social spendings or spending on health or education. By our publication, we wanted to uh, reverse this uh, thinking uh, to emphasize that education and health are important areas of state activity that can bring a high rate of return in the future. It is especially important as we have the economy which is more and more dependent on the quality of uh, human capital. 
Um, and that's all from my side. Now I'm expecting an interesting discussion. Uh, please, Philip, as I know, Philip, you have some uh, comments to, the, to, uh, to our paper. Thank you, Jakub. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to briefly discuss the stimulating paper. I will also try to share my slides. I hope that works. Can you see them? Yes, yes, we can see. Okay, very good. Um, so let me start with a very brief summary um, of how I read the paper. I mean, your, your starting point is basically this new emerging fiscal consensus, right, which states that fiscal policy plays a major role both in terms of stabilization policy as well as in raising potential output, given that we have a change in the macroeconomic environment compared to a couple of decades ago with persistently low interest rates, and therefore we should rethink the role of fiscal policy. That is kind of the starting point. And then you uh, present this survey on the long-term benefits uh, of investment, uh, including investment in human capital. And uh, this is then the basis for your proposal in terms of extending the definition of public investment to also cover human capital investment. So I think the main contribution of the policy uh, brief is basically that you are promoting a discussion of what should be counted as public investment uh, and what should not be counted uh, as a public investment. And I, I'm um, very happy with uh, this promotion of a discussion. I think this is to be applauded. And more broadly, it's uh, kind of uh, on the debate about the role of the state in the economy and kind of the policy brief makes us think about the links between investment and this emerging fiscal new fiscal policy consensus. Um, and kind of the focus of uh, the policy brief is also uh, consistent with, for example, uh, a relatively recent survey that was conducted in Germany where people were asked uh, whether they agreed with certain fiscal policy priorities, where actually 90% said that uh, more investment in education should be prioritized, uh, about 90% said they would like to see more investment in elderly care, 80% said it's about affordable housing, and only 23% said it's about reducing government debt and 80% agreed with the priority of um, pushing for more defense spending. So from a fiscal policy perspective, you could argue, and this is kind of a point you make, that we are in a knowledge economy, investments are often not in physical terms. Um, <clears throat> however, uh, then the question arises, <clears throat> okay, if we now, for example, increase public investment for physical stuff like building daycare centers to promote early childhood education, something that you also focus on uh, in your policy brief, how do we then pay the teachers and educators that are needed to actually run these institutions successfully? So I think the question we should pose in the debate is, um, what does this actually tell us about whether and how we should change the way public investment is measured in official statistics to allow for adequate uh, fiscal spending, given the policy goals policymakers want to reach. From an uh, economic point of view, it's also important, uh, this discussion about what actually counts as investment and what doesn't, because uh, economists often argue that, well, if investments have long-term benefits, uh, and if they benefit future generations, they should at least partly be financed by issuing government bonds, because future generations also benefit, and so they should also be uh, kind of um, included uh, in the financing. However, the, the question then is, um, do we want to debt finance uh, health spending, for example, on elderly care or also um, some, some stuff in terms of education spending that uh, kind of needs to be conducted on a permanent basis? So here it becomes, I think, more tricky, and that's why you need like clear criteria on how you distinguish investment spending from non-investment spending. So this, that this also makes sense from an economic point of view. So the crucial question is, where do you draw the line? You kind of start this uh, debate or promote this debate on distinguishing investment and non-investment spending, and you acknowledge kind of uh, that uh, what you come up with is only a draft methodology that allows for calculating and comparing investments in physical capital and human capital in public and private sectors. However, um, the question is then how can we come up with changes to data collection and classification that would be required to actually come up with a, um, a finer methodology. 
So uh, let me finish by uh, just um, posing some questions that I think we would need to answer um, if we uh, are to follow up on this. First of all, there is the question, what long-term benefits are we to consider? So what long-term benefits of investment should be considered? What, for example, about elderly care? Here you could probably argue um, that they have large uh, benefits in the long term for society if you have a, a well-working elderly care system. However, the question is, uh, from an economic point of view, is it something that also raises potential output and uh, should therefore uh, be considered um, as a similar investment compared to uh, investment in, in fixed assets. Um, then another issue is, if you have public investment, with, which is a flow you have every year, which contributes to the physical capital stock, uh, then typically what is done is you also account for depreciation to arrive at net investment figures, because that allows you to actually come up with a judgment, which is important of, of whether the public capital stock is actually increasing or decreasing. If you would have an enlarged investment concept, also including a human capital investment, the question is, how would that work with this enlarged investment concept? How could you account for depreciation uh, in human capital to arrive at net investment numbers? And then from a political point of view, um, I think you could argue that, uh, well, what you measure is to some extent political. Data are political or data definitions are political. I think that is uh, one of the things you argue in the policy brief. Um, however, I think we need to take into account that there are uh, somewhat uh, political hurdles here as well, because it might be more difficult to reach a consensus on definition of investment beyond the status quo based on national accounts, given that there are also other uh, or different political priorities uh, of what should be uh, considered as investment. So let me finish by saying this is an important debate, and um, I, I applaud that your policy brief is contributing to this debate. The crucial question is where do we draw the line in defining investment versus non-investment? Um, so do we need to change uh, the definition of investment to move forward with the new fiscal policy consensus? I mean, you answer this uh, question with a resounding yes. Um, uh, but if you are to uh, answer this question with a yes, then the question comes up, what are like robust criteria of how you can distinguish investment, non-investment? Because this is also important from a political point of view. For example, if you have a fiscal rules framework that prioritizes certain investment because it is kind of excluded from, um, um, from certain deficit numbers. Um, here, it becomes clear that uh, these um, distinctions are very important. I would argue that a substantial part of government spending in education and healthcare is probably not investment in a strict sense, but it's still very important. Um, this is something that should not be financed by issuing government bonds. Uh, like other um, other parts of investment, but it should be financed out of current tax revenue. I'm thinking here about um, education spending, um, but also uh, about elderly care, for example. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to discuss this, and I'm looking forward to the debate. So, Wojciech, uh, maybe you will start with some comments to the Philips, uh, Philip, Philips presentation. Thanks a lot, Philip, uh, for, your, uh, for your very nice discussion. And thanks a lot uh, to all of us, uh, to all of you who are listening and who are with us. It's, it's good to have you. Um, um, I'm going to partly answer to your comments, uh, Philip, or, or address, try to address them and, and partly share my my reading of, uh, of the report as well. Um, I'm going to underline two key results here, which we were quite surprised with, uh, to be honest. One is that um, when we include education and uh, healthcare spending, and I'm going to go back to your, uh, to your point, Philip, about where we draw the line, um, we saw and we noticed that state is actually not an idle actor, and it's you know, it's not particularly uh, about one country in, uh, in the European Union, it's actually across the board. Uh, around 12% of GDP is actually state investment in future benefits. And second was that there's almost, almost perfect separation. The private sector invests in physical capital a lot. The state does not invest in physical capital that much. 
But on the other hand, it is the state that is actually most responsible for investment in human capital, health, and, uh, and education as we define it. Whereas the private sector is not too much interested in those investments. Uh, so I guess the, these are the most two, the two most important results that, that were quite surprising, at least for me, when, uh, when we finished uh, the data analysis for this report. Um, but there are issues. One, the first important issue is, is what Philip said and uh, where we draw the line. What is what is human capital investment and what is not human capital investment? And you know, the rule of thumb is whoever it pays for itself. That that would be my answer. So whether if you spend money for it and uh, you can retain that money later on in form of increased tax revenues, that's an investment. Um, why did we include healthcare and um, education? Well, because we have we have uh, we have strong backing from uh, from literature that those investments do pay for themselves. Uh, they have very high uh, returns if you measure them economically above ten percent. Sometimes, uh, sometimes, in a multitude of uh, of the costs that they entail. Uh, so this this is a starting point. We tried to be conservative uh, in the sense that, for example, we excluded hospital care, assuming after some lengthy discussions that, okay, hospital care is, is more of a, you know, saving lives rather than investing in human capital. But actually it's not, uh, it's, it's not precisely so. so. For example, giving birth in a hospital is, is beautiful investment in human capital at the very beginning of, uh, of life, uh, but we excluded it. We, you know, we excluded all hospital. Uh, um, hospital care. Uh, the second problem is that we actually have a little bit of the overlap in the sense that some investments are both in physical capital and human capital. Uh, we, we, we are explicit about it in the report in the sense that when you build a school, uh, when the state builds a school, or even if the private investor builds a school, that is investment in physical capital because school is physical, you can touch it, you can see it. But at the same time, it actually it's not used in the production process. It is used to, to produce human capital. Um, and that is the problem. So we have no way and, you know, where we draw the line is ultimately the case of how granular data we have. Uh, if we had, you know, the data on every single school, we could say, okay, this school goes to human capital investment as opposed to physical capital investment, but we don't have that granularity. Uh, so we, we have to make some, um, some uh, approximations there um, and I guess the main message is that there is there are different investments to physical investments uh, as Jakub said in the beginning you know when the state builds a road we're happy because we're seeing investment from from the state when the state invests in in healthcare it is under the uh, under the expenditure public expenditure um, label uh, in, in national statistics. So obviously, before we get to the Eurostat to to agree, uh, before we get the community, the academic community to agree on a, on a different definition of Eurostat to implement it, that's a long, long journey um, without many hopes for success. But uh, the the public discussion is important uh, to show that actually not only investing in railroads is investment, uh, as we understand it. And the final thing is um, how to finance it. And we're, you know, we're, we're giving a hint in this report by talking about the public debt uh, and, and that is essentially a low cost financing. Um, sorry, that is, that's quite cheap nowadays. And, and in a sense, what you're saying, Philip, and I fully agree with that is that this should be given that these are uh, ongoing expenditures. Some of them will be increasing as part of GDP in the future, like for example, elderly care. Uh, this should be financed on a permanent rolling basis rather than a one-off big investment project that we can finance taking up debt. Uh, and I, I agree with you that this is to be, uh, in the long run, to be tax financed. The question is how do we split those taxes between today's generation and future generation? Given that future generations will benefit from those investments, um, you know the uh, the argument goes that future generations could also partly be contributing to those investments today, and the only way to spread the burden between across generations going into the future is through rolling 
rolling those taxes, spreading those taxes uh, into the future. Um, and we can do it cheaply now because the public debt is, is at historical low um, prices. Um, I guess, uh, sorry if I'm, if, I, if I'm too chaotic, but these are, these are the main thoughts uh, and, and the main messages I wanted to include uh, in, in that discussion. Thanks a lot for, for having me. Thanks a lot for your discussion. I'll, I'll be really happy if you, could, if you could share your slides later on after, after, after the discussion. That would be really helpful. I'm happy, I'm happy to do that. May I quickly react to what, what, what you were Go saying? Ahead, yeah. um, so very, very th thoughtful points uh, you made. I mean, um, I have to say, I'm, I'm obviously very sympathetic with uh, the main messages uh, of your report. Um, the state can be a, um, a good investor, and this is a, an important message also for the public debate. The public debate is important, and therefore the discussion you're promoting here about what actually should count as investment um, and that it, maybe parts of what's nowadays counted as public consumption is actually um, has more of an investment character. This, this is a very important uh, debate to have. And I think it, it's nice that you kind of try to link this with uh, the recent um, developments in terms of the new fiscal policy consensus that is emerging um, based on um, contributions by uh, Anglo-American uh, scholars, which has now uh, also reached uh, reached Europe. My second point is, uh, and that's why I, I was um, I was keen to discussing why, from an economic point of view, or why many economists would think it is important to think very carefully about what what you count as investment and, and what not. For example, in Germany, you have this debate about the golden rule. So you have the debt break. And you have uh, several actors arguing that basically uh, there are huge investment needs. Um, so we should have um, one, one estimate is uh, 450 billion in public investment over the next 10 years, which is mostly uh, investment in um, physical infrastructure, um, but not only. And then the question is, how can you actually finance this uh, given the, the, the fiscal rules you have? So now you have you had the, the, the golden rule in Germany until 2007, which kind of says that you are allowed to debt finance um, net um, government investment. And now there are discussions about whether we should have something similar again to kind of push uh, to kind of push investment. And here it becomes obvious that, uh, what would you count as investment is of crucial importance um, and uh, something I think you would need to, I, I don't know what the discussion is in Poland or, or, in, or, in, or in other countries, but I think this, this idea about something similar to a golden rule um, is something you find uh, in other parts of the debate as well. But with your definition, um, maybe 10 or 20% of GDP could then be kind of debt financed if you, if you had a, a golden rule like that. Uh, so... Um, yeah, that's why uh, all, all this discussion about classification is so important. We need to have it, and I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure we need to have, a, uh, over the, the medium to long run, also a change in the official um, statistics and classification. Um, the question is, um, as, I, as I said, and as you also reiterated, where exactly to draw the line? You need very, I think, specific criteria um, of, of what to include or exclude. I'm not sure whether ha just having data with more granular granularity helps because then it, it's still um, the question what criteria you use about whether you include this school or, or exclude that school. Right, right. So now, now quickly coming back, the more granular data will be necessary but not sufficient to, to, to proceed with that exercise. Um, uh, actually, instead of answering, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give, give you an, an hour to all the people that, that, that are with us, a, a little bit different perspective. Um, what, what, what you're saying, Philip, is that, uh, you know, if the state invests in physical capital, it could get a break from the golden rule. Uh, so it could be debt finance, uh, whereas what do we include as a human capital investment? And should these similar rules apply to, to the public sector? When, when doing that. I'm not going to give you an answer on that um, because we don't want to go that far with, with, uh, with this report. Uh, but actually there is a very similar discussion right now going on in, in, here in the UK, but it comes from the private sector. Um, the private sector has tax breaks if they invest 
in uh, physical capital, but they get nothing in the, if they invest in human capital. So actually the private sector is lobbying more and more to include they, their expenditures, firms' expenditures on investment in human capital, like uh, you know, sending their, uh, their employees to, to improve their skills, to do training, to um, things like that. They get no benefits for that, but if they buy new cars for the company, they get tax benefits. So I think, uh, you know, this is, this is in a sense, very different discussion, but it's along the same lines and, and along, along the, the similar thinking and similar arguments coming in from our report, uh, as you know, as, as we're discussing here about breaks for the public sector investments in human capital, but it's all also coming from the private sector itself. So, uh, Thank you, Gasco, because you were discussing just without uh, any need from myself, any management. So, but I would like to now to ask you some questions from the audience, because we have now one question, which uh, Wojtek answered already, uh, but I want you to answer it for the whole audience. So the question is, is in social investment literature, family benefits seem to be included. Did you review this literature? And the second question, what about family benefits, for example, 500 plus in Poland? Are there any, any investment made by the, uh, by the state? But uh, can you uh, uh, answer it briefly? So and uh, and okay. to the audience, if you have any other question, please write them down and we will answer it then. So, so the short answer is no, um, because what we're looking at is we're looking at the final expenditure. Um, so, it, you know, a family 500 plus pins of plus uh, family benefits is a transfer. So it's not included in final expenditure as we look at it. We're looking at the GDP from the expenditure point of view. So we're looking how the, uh, the money is being spent uh, when there is a transaction happening. So when there are goods and services being purchased uh, with the money. Uh, when you have a transfer, you don't have any transaction happening. It goes from one party to the other party, and then only then later on it is spent. So, you know, uh, to rephrase that, if, uh, if family benefits are being spent on schooling, that we would count as uh, investment in human capital. If they're spent on, I don't know, mortgage payments or to buy a car for the um for the self-employed uh, parents you know that would be physical capital investment if they're spent on most other things you know that would be uh, private consumption um so to uh, we can't add family uh, benefits on top of our uh, measure of human capital and physical uh, capital investment, because that would entail a double counting. Uh, so we would count the same money twice when it changes hands and when it is spent uh, later on. Uh, we understand that, you know, from income perspective, that would be an investment in the, in the social, uh, in, in, in that literature, but we're looking from, from a different angle. I'm not sure, Jakub, maybe you could help if, if, if I'm being, if I'm making myself clear here. Yes, you were you were clear, I think. And we have two other questions. I think to both of you, you can answer them. And this would be the last questions in our meeting. So the first one is, uh, do you believe that your broader definition of investments could contribute to explaining GDP growth rates, stagnation in the EU South or inequalities, no incentives for human capital investments in EU countries? That's the first question. And the second is you have been arguing for rethinking public investments on categories that are generally supposed to fix market failures. Would you agree with a concept of mission economy proposed by Mariana Mazzucato? Hence going beyond just fixing inefficiency and reintroducing state-led economic growth. If so, to what extent uh, can the state be a good investor there too? So please answer these two questions. I think both of you can answer it. Philip, maybe you first. Sure, thanks for the great questions. Um, uh, let me start with the first question regarding um, Southern European countries and uh, whether uh, cuts in investment played a role there in terms of um, their economic development during the Euro crisis. I mean, um, this is an important point. If you look at the data, 
which I did like two or three years ago, you actually find that um, due to uh, severe fiscal consolidation efforts uh, starting from 2010, there were um, very severe cuts to um, health expenditure, but also education expenditure in Southern European countries. I mean, that is also something you kind of find in your in your new uh, investment um, measure, basically, where you showed that uh, the, the, the lowest investment numbers are actually for the Southern European countries. Uh, so, for example, for Greece, you find that there were uh, cuts to, uh, to health spending by close to 50% in real terms uh, over a period of just a couple of years. And obviously, that also had devastating consequences for the population. And that's why it's important to, to discuss um, well, the role of the state and um, the, the, the impact of fiscal policy uh, also in, in, in broader terms. I mean, um, there's, there's a literature showing that um, austerity had very broad um, effects, uh, not only in economic terms, but also in social terms, because if you uh, run into health problems due to cuts, uh, due to cuts in the health sector, um, this, this has major, uh, major and broader implications. So um, from this perspective, it would be important to, to focus more on um, education spending and health spending as well. And uh, concerning the second, uh, the second question, I mean, I would, I would certainly agree uh, that um, it's very restrictive to just uh, discuss the role of the state in terms of it should fix certain market failures um, that um, is uh, kind of falling short um, I'm, I'm aware of this concept of mission-oriented public investment by Matsukato, who also argues that kind of um, the, 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 the state um, and public investment uh, in research and development uh, and um, also uh, some, some uh, infrastructure um, investment should be seen as kind of uh, risk-taking where some investment might also go bad. And that's why it's important to also discuss uh, why we need a different narrative about um, the public sector um, and, and public spending. Uh, and in this regard, it's probably also good to discuss what should be counted as, um, as investment or, or non-investment. I would certainly agree that we need to move the debate in this, uh, in this regard. Wojtek? Very quickly, uh, uh, thanks, Philip. I, I think you, you, you've managed and tackled well both questions. We do observe on, on question one about, you know, whether it explains growth rates, the low investment, whether it we do observe correlation, we don't go as far to say uh, which, which way it goes. So we see that actually those, as, as Philip reiterated, the, the southern countries are doing pretty bad on public investment in both human and physical capital. And we also know that they had hard time last, uh, throughout the last decade, for which we um, show the data for. Um, there is certainly correlation, there is certainly causality that may go both ways, we're agnostic about it. Um, and uh, on the second one, um, you say that, you know, we uh, argue for a state role as fixing market inefficiencies. And we know that, uh, you know, the literature is quite open about market failures and is also quite open about government failures. And, and we do acknowledge that. Um, what you're asking is whether we would like to go a step further in, into public sector-led growth. Uh, we don't want to go there because we believe that if we, can this, if we can get this message through that actually a state can be an important actor in the game, and, and we actually use this term that you know, public and private sectors are not rivals, they're not competitors. Uh, they have their distinctive roles, and if we can acknowledge that there is um, something like human capital investment, as we describe it. And if we acknowledge that the data says that state is, is, is the main player in, in that area, and if we can acknowledge that there are returns from that investment which benefit the economy and the society, that would go a long way from the point in which uh, you know, the state and regulation is just hurting markets and uh, and, 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 and it's only idle, the state is idle and, and very inefficient. So if we can move that public debate from, you know, looking at the public sector as extremely inefficient into, okay, there is some role, uh, that, will, that would go a long way. That, that would already be, be, um, be quite a lot. 
Thank you very much, guys. So we are now finishing our meeting. Um, as I said at the beginning, I hope uh, our paper and this debate, debate also will just open the discussion about uh, what we understand by uh, public investment. Uh, sorry again by my tech for my technical problems uh, with my camera, but uh, I think what is most important that Wojciech and Filip were seen and heard uh, well. So thank you very much again, and I hope see you again. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Thanks a lot. Stay safe, everyone.